If you have your Bible and you want to turn with me, we'll be in the book of Mark, chapter 8. Uh, we'll be in verse 31 through 37 today as we get rolling uh, this morning. So we do that. Can we pull the house lights up just a little bit more if we can? That way I want you to be able to see the word. That way you know if I'm telling the truth or not. If I'm not, don't yell it out. Well, you can. If I ever don't tell the truth, I guess you can interrupt that. But you better be sure I'm not telling the truth. We do that. Man, aren't you glad you're here? Amen. I mean, church, this morning we're talking about pursuing our calling in Christ. And uh, last week was a, such an interesting week for me. Um, I've never been um, in isolation like I was uh, in, in all of my existence, um, even quarantined with chicken pox. I saw people I love more as a child than I did over the past few weeks. Um, it's an interesting thing um, when it's anywhere from 61 day to negative one outside. Um, what, what your season with the Lord does. And as I was, I was out there, uh, there's so many things God just sharing with me. And, and a big part of that was, was simplicity. Was, was the reality that God has not called us to something difficult. He's not calling us to something that's impossible. He's, he's calling us to something amazing and glorious and complex. Don't get me wrong. But it's not difficult. And I think I had, I had some of the, the kids make me some origami, a little paper airplane. One of these things, I think this is what I used to do to see if I could start a conversation with a girl. Right? You, you pick a number and you do one of these things. Um, when I was in junior high here. I never made them for myself, but I stole them sweetly. Got a little, little hat here. Let me tell you, any of you in here ever want to be good at origami? Anyone ever buy a book, How to Do Origami? Anyone ever commit that to the devil because you couldn't do origami? That was me. Like, I... I as much as I want to, uh, my, my folding, or maybe it's probably my instruction ability, is not fantastic. I could never get a, get a boat out of a piece of paper like this. And even if it's refolded, I would have a difficult time. <clears throat> Some of you are not old enough to know what a car map is. Okay? It, it hasn't always been on your cell phone, just a heads up. Or a garment, as our staff learned this week. You can ask Pastor David about that later. I, I, I could never fold it back right. I could get close, I think. But it just seems like origami is one of those things that is difficult. That even if you were to give me instructions and were to, to fold the paper in advance, there's only like a 30% chance that what I end up with looks like what you did to begin with. And church, somewhere along the way, you and I, I believe, started seeing our faith like spiritual origami. Like we have a book of masters of origami. They wrote origami Yoda. You know what I mean? They, they, they pinned all, they, they were able to do the unthinkable. And, and you see a few people here and there, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, you know, whoever your favorite fill-in-the-bank preacher or saint of the day is. Like they have figured out how to pursue God through a spiritual origami that we would love to have, we would long to embrace. But if we're honest... If I can just go to heaven and get a paper, like I win. Like my faith looks much more like this than something complex. And I would love for it to be more, but, but I just have made faith spiritual origami. And what I want to share with you today is that there's only one person who makes pursuing our calling difficult. And it is not the author of the calling. It's me. It's you. It's, it's our individuals. You see, this is where the complexity, we interpret it as difficulty. But that's not what Jesus has called us to. 
If you're in your Bible, look, check this out with me. We'll read verse, chapter 8, verse 32, uh, right in there. Excuse me, my Bible flip. 31, we'll read down to 37 today. And, and I want you to listen very closely because in this passage, God gives us this foundation, not for this insane folding technique to become a believer in Christ who is solid and strong, but something very simple. The Bible says this, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must first suffer things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing this, seeing his disciples, Jesus rebukes Peter. And he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but you are setting them on the things of man. And then he calls the crowd close to him with his disciples. And he says to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to save to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? And I want you to know this passage, if you have your Bible out and, and listen, there's some, some subtitles in the Bible, the sectional things, they weren't there. God didn't put them there originally, but to help us understand they did. This, this is kind of a weird thing. When Jesus, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow, deny yourself, follow me. When he says that, it is shimmed between two events. One, the confession of Peter. Peter says, listen, Jesus, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, man, great job. Now let me tell you what the Christ has to do. I, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be, be dead. And after three days rise again. And he says it plainly. And Jesus said, and Peter says, hey, Jesus, I just said you were the Christ. You talking about death kind of makes that not look right. And Jesus rebukes him and talks about our calling. And then right after this calling, if you look a bit further down in, in chapter 9, you see that the transfiguration happened. And the, the transfiguration, what we, the, the short title for a long passage, is when Jesus took some of his disciples up and he went on the mountain to pray. And God allowed him to commune with him. And, and we have Elijah and Moses show up on the scene. And God says, hey, listen to this guy. This is my son. Listen. Two amazing events about the reality of Jesus. And let me tell you the difference between difficult and simple. Jesus says, I will take care of the difficulty from turning you into a blank piece of paper into what you desire to be in me, so to speak. I will take you from being messed up, dirty, squished like my Play-Doh was. I will take you from that, and I, I will do the difficult thing. How do I know? Because Jesus says, the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must be rejected by the elders and the chiefs chief chief priests and the scribes. The son of man must be killed and the son of man must rise again in three days. Note to self, that is harder. That is harder than take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. That's the difficult part. Church, if you leave with nothing else today, I want you to leave with this. Jesus says, I have covered the difficulty. I have covered the hard part. But to the disciples, the Bible says, he speaks plainly. He speaks, he doesn't want anyone to be confused. And when Peter is confused, when he pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, I have totally missed it. Now he doesn't say that, but that's what he, he does. I've totally missed it. Jesus rebukes him and he looks around and in that moment he draws everybody in and he says, I don't want you to miss this because I'm calling you to a pursuit. I'm calling you to respond to my calling and I don't want you to be confused thinking it's this overly complex mess. I've taken care of all of that. And so in this, in chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus then unpacks a beautiful, simple calling for you and I. 
Look in your Bible, verse 34. It says this. It says, Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, the call of Christ is an invitation to move. It's an invitation to move. Church, this is something that we miss all too often. In the very beginning of the passage, it says, he called the crowd to him and says, listen, if you want to come after me, then you are going to have to come. You're going to have to stop doing what you're doing. You're going to have to leave where you are, and you're going to have to move. When Jesus says, if you would come after me, it would be more in our, our terminology. It would sound more like this. If any of you want to arrive, here's what you do. If any of you want to arrive, here's what you do. Do you feel the power in that? Listen, move is what your mean uncle says when you go to his house and sit in his chair on accident. Amen? Move. Well, there's nowhere else to sit. I don't care. Move. Jesus, when he says move, he says, if you want to arrive, then you're going to have to move. You see, there's a destination implied in the call of Christ. Christ is calling you and I from where you are to a new place. And so in this moment, it begs a question. When someone says, hey, do you want to move? Do you want to come with me? It begs the question, where are we going? There's got to be a destination. The call of Christ is not an empty call, but it follows the characteristics and the pattern of God all throughout Scripture. God continually calls us to move from to. I mean, think about this with me. He called Noah to move from a wicked people into a big wooden boat and trust him that it would be God's provision he called Abram to leave his family and his land in Haran and, and move to the promised land. He called Moses to leave the comfort of the mountains and his family and the sheep to Egypt to bring out the people of God. He called David from the fields working in the, in the flocks to the throne of Israel. He calls Gideon hiding in the wine press to lead the people of God into his promise. Every time God calls you and I to move, he is inviting you and I to arrive at his promise. That's, that's the call. That, that's the beauty of Jesus saying, come after me. Now here, here's what's awesome, is we know that we have to move from and to. What does that promise look like? Where did you call me from in the origin of our relationship? And Peter speaks it out for us. The one that Christ rebuked would later, later write these words. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of God who called you. Are you ready? This is how God calls us. Who called you out of darkness into his glorious light, into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, this is, this is a piece of the move. It's understanding that where you are is in darkness in your relationship with God. Outside of Christ Jesus, without pursuing the call of Christ Jesus, that you are in darkness. And you may have mastered darkness. You may, have, you may feel like your sense of hearing is peaked. You may feel like your sensitivity in your hands is high. You may think that you can navigate life outside of Christ, but to someone who is in the light, you are stumbling around, wasting time, flirting with death at every moment. And God is saying, you do not have to be there if you want to arrive in the light, in the marvelous light, as a people with a promise and a destiny and with mercy, then follow me. Church, this is the call of Christ. 
Because if he just said, move, I don't care where, just get out of the darkness any way you can, then he would expose you. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is telling a story of a man who notices his life is messed up in darkness. We, we don't know what's going on, but it's, his life is filled, it says, with a demon. He's addicted, maybe. Pornography, alcohol, success, money, relation, whatever it is. Whatever it is that's so detrimental, he realizes he needs to clean up his life. And so the demon leaves for a season, and the man cleans his life up. And the Bible says that Jesus says when that demon comes back, he will see that there are room for more demons because the man has cleaned up his own life and organized it so that more darkness can find its way in. You see, if you and I try to leave and move from the dark parts of our life, if we try to run from our sin and we aren't filling our life with Jesus Christ, you are seeking temporary relief for deeper depths of darkness. God is inviting you and I through Christ Jesus to move. And that move involves abandonment. The Bible says that, that Jesus told them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Church, the call of Christ is an invitation for you to abandon to, to deny yourself. This is a refusal to acknowledge. Let me put it this way. Does anyone here have a hard problem with ignoring someone when you want to? Right? Like how to ignore your friend is a class that no one would need to take. Amen? Right? You, so you can say amen to that. Amen? Amen. If, if you didn't say amen, you're a liar. You need Jesus. No, but seriously. Seriously. To, to deny yourself means that you and I need to refuse to acknowledge. This is what Christ is calling us to. He's saying part of the call in following me is moving. And when you move, denying the darkness. Refuse to acknowledge it. Ignore it. And never give it place again. In the Bible, there's a phrase called devote to destruction. It's told all throughout the story of the people of God taking the promised land. 22 times in Scripture, God tell his, tells his people to devote something, someone, a place to destruction. And what it means is abandon your sin, get rid of it, don't keep it around you any longer. Don't flirt with it, don't, don't stay with it, don't put it on the shelf where you can access it again. Abandon, deny yourself, that passion that grips you. That, that sin that so easily entangles you. What God doesn't say is, hey, try a test. Go without that sin for a week. If it doesn't work, we'll keep it. We'll, we'll, we'll replay. In, in, in a church I served at, we, we were remodeling the sanctuary. And, and, and one of the church members, a good godly man, when the church was in need and electric bills were high, went and got ceiling fans for the sanctuary. They were amazing. The problem is if you got a little too evangelist, a little charismatic, you had less fingers to worship God with. Amen? You following me? And, and I loved this man, and as we started to take him down, in, in order not to hurt him, I said, here's the deal. If we're wrong, I won't throw these away. For 15 years, those fans today are still hidden under the pulpit at the church. He knows they're there, just in case we're wrong. You see, regretfully, you and I, to appease ourselves, often treat our sin like I treated those ceiling fans. Like they're taken down, they're not connected to electricity, they're hard to get to. But that is not what God is calling you to if you want to pursue him. He's not calling you to dismantle your sin. He's not calling you and I to just put it out of eyesight. He's not calling you and I to keep it around in case he's wrong. He's not wrong. Devote it to destruction so that the sin in your life, the aroma that is even connected with it, is no longer present. It's no longer active. It's no longer there 
to tempt you even from afar. When Jesus says, if you want to come after me, if you want to move, if you want to arrive in the marvelous light, then you have to be willing to abandon the desires that have led your life up to this point, even the ones that you think are good, and you need to come after me. You, you, you've got to leave the gods of your life behind. In church, when Jesus says, come after me and deny yourself, he does something amazing. He connects the call to follow with the rejection of sin. I think too often you and I aren't, aren't able to reject sin because we see it as a personal defeat when we try to reject sin and then we stumble and pick it back up again. What Jesus says here is, if you want to understand sin, then it's not about you. It's about me. It's time for you to stop seeing sin as personal defeat and see it as an active offense against our relationship. Because God is the central figure of our call. The abandonment of it is not abandoned and then. It goes hand in hand with an invitation to embrace. You see, because Jesus hasn't said, hey, I just want you to suffer, get rid of your sin, and float around until I do it. As you let go of your sin, we are called to embrace Christ. See, that's the call. This is the, this is the wooing of the Spirit. This is the only God part of it. It's not letting go and then figuring it out. It's by the Spirit, by the call of God, that you move to abandon and embrace simultaneously. Jesus says this, and calling the crowd, he says to them, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would arrive in a relationship with me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Church, at the time, the cross was such a wretched figure. We, we could talk about the historical significance of this, of how that would have felt to the disciples in the moment. And we need to know it would have been an affront to them, but we live on this side of the cross. Do you think when Jesus spoke, he spoke in, in a single dimension? Do you think when he spoke these words that you were not on his mind? If before you were conceived, he knew every day of your life. Do you know that when the Savior spoke, your name was there? And for a believer, 2,000 years after these words are spoken, he says, listen, deny yourself and take up your cross. Embrace what I have done in your daily life. Know who you are. Paul would understand the cross differently a few years later when he wrote to the Corinthian church. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Church, listen. To pursue Christ, you, you can't just add him in because you have to abandon everything else you've been holding on to. Jesus is not an additive to sweeten up your good life already. He's not just a mixture he says, completely abandon and completely embrace. To take up your cross daily means that you and I wake up understanding that in Christ Jesus, you are new every day. In Christ Jesus, you no longer have a story with the darkness. In Christ Jesus, you have been given a purpose to share the reconciliation that God shared with you. That in Christ Jesus, you are new. You are not refurbished. You are not cleaned up. You are new. You see, this is the call to pursue. Church, if you and I as believers... 
confuse this calling with simple abandonment of sin, then you are not pursuing the call of Christ. Only if you and I know that God is calling us to move, to abandon what we've had, and to embrace the call of God, a new creation, a new course, a new life through Jesus Christ, whom God made sin, who had no sin. Why? So that you could be in Christ, the righteousness of God, so that you could live in a right relationship with God. This is the call of pursuit. This is what our whole life, not just our year, but our whole life has to come to. And in that, it makes abandonment easier. Listen, Omar talked about being homesick. Let me tell you what, when your family comes up on that phone, it takes a little bit of that away. There's nothing like being in their presence, but it takes a little bit of that away. Hey, check this, church. Until you see Jesus face to face, you are going to be homesick in your relationship with him. If you are not calling and pursuing this embrace, that it's like taking a 12-month retreat from your family and never picking up the phone. 